everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and we're on to the next part of my documentary about the album Chinese Democracy. So today we're talking about 1998. So if you guys have not seen any of my previous episodes, instead of doing one long documentary about Chinese Democracy, I'm breaking it up by year. So I've done 93 through 97 so far. If you guys want to check those out, I've got a playlist specifically called Chinese Democracy Documentary. You can go check them out. So I'm going to do all the way up to 2008. So today we're starting with 1998. And Geffen Records was getting pretty nervous at this point in time. It had been about a little over four years since Guns N' Roses had put out their last release. And nothing had worked so far. And Axel hadn't even come up with song ideas yet for the record. So in early 1998, Geffen Records dispatched A&R man James Barber to work with the band. So James Barber gave an interview in 2005 where he said the following. He said, nothing else had worked, so Geffen figured they'd send me in to talk to Axel after I moved to L.A. No expense was spared. They were the biggest band in the history of the label, and even though everyone except Axel was gone, Geffen Records lived and breathed for another GNR album. We desperately wanted the album for Christmas of 98, and I had a year to get it finished. So in the, in 2005, the New York Times wrote a really good piece about Chinese democracy, and, and they basically titled it the most expensive album that was never made. So according to Eddie Rosenblatt, who was an executive with Geffen Records. He led Geffen Records. He said in 1998 and 1999, you start getting a little bit nervous. After uh, David Geffen had departed, um, Edgar Brofman, who was the CEO of parent company Seagram, picks up the phone more than once. He wanted to know what was going on, and you unfortunately don't really have an answer to give him. You don't know because you really don't know. So around February of 1998, Guns N' Roses manager Doug Goldstein has a correspondence with Rolling Stone magazine, and he says that GNR have recorded more than 300 hours worth of material, and they basically each take a CD home, listen for cool parts, pick them out, and that's how they build the songs. Now, some bits were three seconds long, some were three minutes long, recalls one studio engineer, Dave Dominguez. He says sometimes it was just a guitar lick, oh, that's cool. They were then transferred to a CD and everything had an ID and a number. Then the CDs were made for each member of the band. They go, okay, on set four, CD three, idea 15, let's do something with that. Then everybody would take their CD home, get the part and write something to that. It was pretty intense, he said. And then around the same time Doug Goldstein talked to Rolling Stone, he said that Axel and company are about three to five months away from actual recording, but says not to expect a record until 1999. And even at this point in time, even though Duff McKagan had left about 10 months prior, so Guns N' Roses were still holding his bass slot in case he decided to come back because around that time Duff had become a father and he was still deciding on his future plans. So in 1998, Axel was spotted at a Tool concert and one of the people that Axel would add to help Guns N' Roses work on their new record would be Billy Howardell. So he'd worked with Tool on their tour as a guitar tech and in Enema sessions as the Pro Tools technician. So Tool was doing a four concert uh, mini tour at the time, which may have overlapped with his GNR duties. So Billy Howardell gave an interview in 2011 where he said, I wound up going into the studio with Guns N' Roses just for an afternoon with Robin Fink from Nine Inch Nails, who got asked to join GNR, and he called me to see if I could come down and help program his sounds for that audition. It was just such an odd thing, you know. We kind of laughed about it, thinking about it. Guns N' Roses, right? So we went there and wound up being a project, and I wound up feeling really attached to it and really wanted to see it through. I became close with Axel and stayed there for two and a half years. He went on to say, I came in there initially to program some guitar sounds and wound up hitting it off with Axel, and then my job kind of migrated into the computer guy. I don't know what you would call me exactly. I kind of was there all night with Axel as he would work. The band came in during the day with a producer and would work most of the day, and then I came in around 10 o'clock at night, say goodbye to those guys. Axel would show up later on, then we'd do our thing all night and then into the next day. So Howardell would be, become basically a jack of all trades to the new band. He said, the first time I went to audition, Axel wasn't there. I auditioned, and oddly enough, the two guys auditioning me were the guys I would later be in two separate bands with. On guitar was Robin Fink, the guitar player who just left Nine Inch Nails to do GNR, and the guy that was playing bass, because we didn't have a bass player at the time, was GNR's Pro Tool engineer at the time. Billy Howardell, who would later do the band A Perfect Circle, but he was also just the Pro Tools guy, and he strapped on a bass, and I had no idea. Who's this weird bass roadie? So Howardell was also responsible for introducing a future band member to Axel. So in early 98, I had been invited down to their studio to meet and hang out with the guys. The purpose being, as Howardell explained, is looking for a producer or a collaborator and someone to bring some modern sounds to. So the person he'd end up introducing to the band would be Chris Pittman. So Chris Pittman gave an interview in 2008 where he said, I was introduced to them through Billy Howardell. He worked for Tool for a while, 
Billy's just a fun guy. He was way into computers and stuff before many people were. And he was doing recordings and playing a bunch of instruments and was like myself. And he turned Axel onto the Lusk record. And Axel was way into the, the was way into the guitar sound and orchestration that we did. So at the start of 1998, Axel had moved the band to Rumble Recorders, which was a three-room studio deep in the San Fernando Valley where Guns N' Roses had recorded the parts for their blockbuster debut, Appetite for Destruction. So the crew turned the studio into a rock star's playground, according to the New York Times. Tapestries, green and yellow lights, state-of-the-art computer equipment, and as many as 60 guitars were at ready, according to people who, of course, were involved in the production. But Mr. Rose wasn't there for the fun and games. What Axel wanted to do, one recording expert who was there recalls, was to make the best record that had ever been made and it's an impossible task so doug goldstein gave that interview to rolling stone in 1998 like i said before he also threw around four producers who were being considered to produce the album including scott litt who worked with rem steve lillywhite who worked with u2 mark bell who worked with york and youth who worked with the verve now we interviewed youth and uh he gave some really interesting background on working with the uh, with the record now he didn't he wasn't there for too long in fact he was he was hired pretty quickly and then he left not too long after that but he gave his insight into what it was like and what axel's state of mind was at the time as well so i've linked that interview down below because it's it's pretty detailed what he goes into and i don't want to cover that in this video and something people may not know is that even mike clink who produced guns and roses first five records was briefly involved uh, while Dave Dominguez was there. He said, Scott Litt came down to meet about the job, as did um, Jay Baum Baumgartner, who produced Papa Roach, and that's how I met him. Robbie Jacobs came down for a week to try out in the schedule, and boredom nearly killed him. There was also one or more, aside from youth, before Sean Bevan was hired, but I can't remember who he said. So in early 1998, Axel finally finds a drummer to at least work on the record for the next couple of years. So Josh Fries gave an interview to Modern Drummer in 2003 where he said, when I got the call to go down and audition for Guns N' Roses, I was at a rehearsals place in LA doing pre-production for record night, a message on my phone from their manager and thought, what? I called him back and he asked if I wanted to audition, but it seemed too big like a bigger than life band. He was persistent, and a couple days later, he said, he said, come and meet Axel and the guys. I went down and auditioned for them sick as a dog. I'd eaten some dodgy seafood in London right before that, gotten on a plane and auditioned that night. I was vomiting all the way to the top of the rehearsal. Axel was totally cool, though, and very open-minded about music. He said, I hear you played with Devo. I really like Devo, and when I liked them, you got the beat up for liking them. I thought the guy was really cool. It became obvious he really listens to music. He was talking about the artists all over the map. They invited me back again, and from the beginning, Axel was so nice, and we got along and had a good time. He was completely open, so I decided to join. So Dave Dominguez told some funny stories about working with Axel in 1998. He'd say Axel would be on for a couple weeks and then off for a couple weeks, recalls Dave Dominguez. So he said that uh, he called in pretty much every day, though Axel would end up asking who was there and what they were doing in the studio. He'd say, tell them that I'm coming in, I'll be there in a while. I'd basically tell the band, Axel called and said he's coming in. Oftentimes he'd never show up, but then when he did, Axel would show up at 2 a.m. or 2.30 a.m. and no one would be around and he'd get upset. Where are they? I don't know, they all left. Then he'd call the next day saying who's there and it would be just Josh Fries. Okay, have everybody leave, have them break, break everything down, we, we're done. So it took two days to break this room down because he fired everybody. So one of Josh Fries's first contribution was to hook up a new bassist to, uh, to audition for the band, and that bassist would end up being Tommy Stinson. So this is a photo of the two of them in the studio in 1998, um, basically working with Axel, or I guess waiting for Axel. So Tommy Stinson gave an interview in 2009 where he talked about some of the tension that happened between him and Paul Hughie. He said there were guys who'd never ever made a record putting out their ideas. At first, they'd, at first those of us who'd actually made records thought the idea sucked, but there were also some good ones. We had to each give reasons for liking or disliking something. You couldn't just be bullheaded. We had to function as a democracy or we'd end up hating each other. Collaborating was good for that. I think every one of us learned a lot from that. So in the later part of 1998, um, Youth would end up coming in and working with the band for a little uh, period of time. So Youth gave an interview to Spin Magazine in 1999. He said, when I walked into the studio, they were rehearsing the old songs to record for a greatest hits package, says Youth. They were going to do them exactly the same way. So my first project was sort of dissuade Axel from doing that. Youth also went on to say that uh, he was able to get Axel to finally sit down and sing for the first time in years. And he said that was one of the reasons why he thinks... Axel was taking so long with the record because he didn't really know where to start. 
Now, even though Youth only worked with the band for a short period of time, he did uh, he was credited on arranging the song Madagascar, and he also brought up the song Prostitute, which Axel was working with. So it seems like a lot of those songs that ended up on the final record came up during those early writing sessions back in the late 90s. So Youth would end up pulling out of the project, but before he did, he was able to get Axel into the studio, but he said that Axel was deeply unhappy. I sensed he was clinically depressed because he only worked from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. He was living a hermit lifestyle. In the end, he told me he wasn't ready, and he was trying to get some spiritual level that would make him happy. And when Youth ushered Rose back into the studio, progress ceased. So I said, next time I come over, I want to record the songs, and he said, you're pushing me too fast. I had to pull out. So what's funny in 1998 is that every news story that came out towards the summer and fall would say that the following month Axel would be going to the recording studio to start putting down the vocals, but then it kept getting delayed and delayed. So by late part of 1998, um, Bryn Bridenthal, who was the, one of the publicists for Geffen, uh, basically said that uh, Axel had, his motivation was to roll up his sleeves and to grind out new music. It may be stronger than ever now because Axel was hoping to revisit the nation's arenas and stadiums with the new material the following summer in 1999. So according to uh, James Barber, who was working with the band at the time, he said the Robin Fink, Josh Freese, Tommy Stinson, Billy Howardell, Dizzy Reed version of the album that existed in 1998 was pretty incredible. It sounded like GNR, but there were elements of Zeppelin, Nine Inch Nails, and Pink Floyd mixed in. So another person, Dave Dominguez, said the time I was on the songs were very industrial sounding with the old GNR elements on top. Axel had some vocal ideas down, but not that many. So James Barber said the record just needed a lead vocal and a mix. If Axel had recorded vocals, it would have been an absolutely contemporary record. So around late 1998, a new producer would step in, which would be Sean Bevan. He would work with Guns N' Roses for about the next two years. And he had been credited with working with Nine Inch Nails in the past, as well as uh, bands like Marilyn Manson and a handful of other uh, artists as well. So we did a pretty long interview with Sean Bevan uh, earlier this year. If you guys want to see the full interview, I've linked to it down below. And we talk all about Chinese democracy and learn a lot of stuff that maybe you guys didn't know about the record. So that does it for today's video, guys. We're going to be talking about 1999 next. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And be sure to hit the subscribe button if you love GNR as much as I do. Take care. Hey, this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs>